All right. Good evening and welcome to Shree Memorial Library author chat series where we showcase authors as we appreciate their work. Shree Memorial Library is hosting author chat series every first Thursday of each month. Tonight we welcome Mike Bunn, he's an author and historian, and his latest work, 14th Colony, The Forgotten Story of the Gulf South During America's Revolutionary Era. Tonight, Mr. Mike Bunn. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna hit the share screen on here real quick and make sure it's, you can see. And I do not see my presentation just yet. <laughs> hmm. Just a second, technical difficulty. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Bond is an author, of course, we've, we've said that, and a historian. He's worked for several cultural heritage organizations in the Southeast. And as he gets his presentation ready, um, he presently serves as the historic Blakely State Park in Spanish Port, Alabama. He's the author and co-author of several books. And of course, tonight we're going to focus in on his latest work, which is The 14th Colony, The Forgotten Story of the Gulf South During America's Revolutionary Era. And I believe that happened somewhere in 1812. And if my history, my eighth grade history memory is correct, I believe that's when Louisiana became a state of the union. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. All right, we're, we're better. I appreciate y'all inviting me and having me. And um, what I hope to do is tell you a little bit about, about this book, which is, uh, it's gonna be a quick overview of this story, of this colony that most people know little about, even, even the people who live here within its former borders. Um, and and that's, that's where the title came from, is, is the simple fact that uh, it's a forgotten story, but it, it's one that's essential to the region's heritage, and I would argue to American history. And I think it'll be, a, it'll be something that opens people's eyes to, a, like I said, a forgotten chapter that's really intriguing. Um, I always like to start my presentations on it by, by using a quote from a, a gentleman who has written as much as anybody about the colony. He's retired from Auburn University, and he observed that most Englishmen and most Americans do not know there was even a colony of British West Florida in the 1760s and 1770s, and I think he's right on. He wrote that back in the 80s, and I think he's right on today. Most people don't realize it. We, we know a little bit of their, our colonial history in the Gulf South. We, we, we're aware that there was a French period, a Spanish period, a British period, maybe. Mike, before you go too much further, mm -hmm. um, you might wanna close your screen share because we're still just seeing your file drive. So make sure that PowerPoint is open. Close okay, your I'm, screen. I'm, sho I'm showing, yeah. I see the screen. It says I'm sharing a PowerPoint. <laughs> yes, close it out and, and try to open it again and then select directly the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, because for some reason, it's still showing us your file folder. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I wanted to stop you before you got too far into uh, the did, presentation. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Now we can see the PowerPoint. Okay, now it's saying the same thing. So if you can see it now, that's all good. <laughs> it's perfect now. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, well, well, apologize for that. Um, but uh, anyway, like I said, the uh, most people don't know there was a, a colony. And um, if you had uh, gone back to the colony at the time, I would venture to say that several people who lived in this British colony of West Florida probably would say it's just as well. Um, a lot of people who first came to British West Florida were not all that enamored with its prospects of first for a variety of reasons. Um, they thought it was could possibly be a waste of resources. And it was at the time for most people who lived on the East Coast, they considered it about as far away from civilization as you could get. And they, they saw little infrastructure, few, few well-established cities. Um, they thought it was a sickly place um, and, and there were disease spread easily. You know, these are the days before air conditioning, before we understood how yellow fever was spread. 
And they just saw it as a dangerous place to live that was about as far away from their world as you can imagine. So there were a lot of people that were skeptical that would work. And that's part of the reason that it's so unknown. The main reason that it remains so unknown is, of course, that during the American Revolutionary War, we had 13 colonies rebel against the British government, famously, um, and we all know that story. But we have forgotten there was an America beyond those western boundaries of those 13 colonies, and uh, British West Florida was one of the colonies that chose not to rebel. And for that, it's forever forgotten as a footnote in history. And I'm hoping that this book will help us recover a little bit of that story and realize that the Gulf Coast did indeed play a role in this, this, this national saga of the establishment of our nation. It's just a little bit different role than maybe was played in Massachusetts or South Carolina, places like that. Um, I want to go back real, real briefly to start this, and I'm going to go fairly quickly over a lot of major points. My goal here is just to familiarize you with the main aspects of this colony's history, how it was founded, what life was like was in it, its political leadership, all those major points. Um, and one of the first major points is how and why it was founded. It, it was, it's, it really goes back to when the British won the Seven Years' War, which was an international war that was really not fought in this area, but had tremendous consequence on the Gulf Coast area. Because prior to the war, um, a lot of the area where we're at um, today in, in Louisiana and in Alabama uh, was claimed by the French. French was a, the French were a major colonial power. And as a consequence of that war, they were they lost the war. They were allied with Spain. They lost the war with Great Britain. It's a story beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But the upshot of the end of the war was that France, as the loser, was forced to cede all of its holdings in North America as a colony. So the, the maps I here have there on the screen, the one on the left shows that big pink area that was French Louisiana. And then as a consequence of the war, 1763, they signed the treaty and they have to leave and they leave it to their ally, a part of it to their ally Louisiana. And then the British go from just holding this little slim area along the coast to being the major player in most of the continent of North America. So that is, that's a sea change on the ground. And what it meant was that the British had new areas that they could then colonize. And they immediately, we all know this leading up to our history of the revolution is that they <laughs> wanted to prohibit settlement beyond the Appalachians for the colonies on the seaboard, try to preserve the peace with North Americans, make an orderly dispersal of those lands. But they gained all this new land on the Gulf Coast and they, they, they immediately moved to organize it into actually two colonies. Um, what they did was organize it into West and East Florida because the whole area was too big to be under one government. So both had, had capitals that were established colonial cities already, St. Augustine in East Florida and West Florida um, was at Pensacola. And there's a, a map showing a little bit of those boundaries <coughs> may not be the best one to show you. This probably illustrates it a little bit better. And I'll, I'll tell you about the boundaries in a second here. <coughs> Excuse me. But that was the original extent of the colony. The, the treaty ending the war established the 31st parallel, which is that dark green line running through what is now lower Alabama over to Louisiana. That was the original boundary that the treaty assigned. And the border was went from the Mississippi River in the west over to the Apalachicola in the east, which is basically the Chattahoochee River, which it hits the Florida line, down to the Gulf Coast. So it incorporated parts of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. That's your original colony of West Florida. And there's a zoom in, a little bit closer detail of those were the actual boundaries as originally created. Now, what happened though, is once the British established this colony in 1763, got people on the ground in 1764, um, immediately they realized that there's some settlements on the Mississippi River, there's some good land on the Mississippi River, and there's really not a lot of European interference blocking them from expanding those borders. So they, they petitioned uh, officials in London to let them move the borders northward. And uh, at first, the, 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 uh, the uh, governor wanted to expand the borders all the way up into what would have been basically northern Birmingham, Alabama today. And they, they ultimately decided that they would expand it, but they wanted to expand it only to where the Mississippi River met 
the met um, the Yazoo River, which is modern day Vicksburg, Mississippi. So that that became the northern boundary. And then that 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 line at 31st parallel, you just move it up and you're talking about essentially Jackson, Mississippi, Montgomery, Alabama. That's yes. where that new border cut through. That was established a few years after the colony was created. And that's the that's the the West Florida that the British would essentially govern the rest of the time they owned that colony. Um, and there's another view, another version of a map just to help you understand where we're talking about. Um, so what the British encountered when they first sent people to actually set up government here is they found uh, a colony which had really two main population centers, one primarily French and Mobile, had been uh, uh, colonized by the French for six decades, and then one in Pensacola, which had been Spanish and had been colonized for them for about the same amount of time. So it's a really unique situation that you've got these two, it's not just one group of people that is, is they're transforming their allegiance, it's, it's two different areas that are all under this one government. But the one common denominator is they weren't impressed with what they saw. <laughs> they, they got there and they realized how much work needed to be done. There was a colony, there were towns, and there was a population, but they were small and the forts were crumbling and the people weren't all that excited to have the British come in. So they knew they had the work cut out for them. And the first first few messages you get from the governors and the military commandants are that, wow, we have a lot to do. And a lot of them really didn't want to be there. Um, and they really all commented on how many people they saw that were sick. Uh, because when the British uh, first sent soldiers there, they were sending them from other places and dramatically different climates. It was their first taste of subtropical weather. And, uh, and they, they came in in the middle of the, of the late summer and they really had a tough time acclimating to it. And so their first few weeks were really rough. Um, same thing in, in Pensacola happened in Mobile. The first guys on the ground were just like, oh my goodness, we've got so much to do. We're so far removed from everything. Um, and, and this is such a sickly place. I'm not sure it's gonna work out. But they persisted and they actually managed to grow a colony, not dramatically as we'll see, but they actually did establish uh, not only new fortifications, but new communities, establish a government, a first taste of representative government on the Gulf Coast. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a compelling story that we'll go through. So this is a, co a copy of the, uh, of the seal of the colony of British West Florida. Uh, in Latin there at the bottom, uh, those words translate into a better fate. In other words, there's hope and prosperity here, almost countering directly the first impressions on the ground. They're saying ultimately this will be a prosperous place. Um, so as I mentioned, it, it had it had a representative government. It was it was uh, 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 governed by a governor with an appointed council, which served as an upper house uh, when when the entire legislative assembly met, and the lower house was elected representatives from each of the main population centers. And those were at first, of course, Mobile and Pensacola. And later on, there's some other small communities that come online and we'll talk about those, Manshack, Campbelltown, we'll mention those later. Um, that's that's the, the big picture. The, the details are that the legislature only met when the governor uh, wanted to call it, deemed it necessary. He had that power. He didn't deem it necessary very often. They only met seven times. They ended up passing only about 50 bills during the entirety of, of, uh, of its existence that became law. And that's another reason, and we'll touch on this again later, is another reason we've forgotten about the colony because that, that argument that about the place of the colonies in the British Empire that we're so familiar with in other places, they never, never really had that form um, here in the same way they did in other places. Now, when, as I mentioned, when the British first arrived, um, you know, just to illustrate the type of society they're taking over, Robert Farmer, who took over Mobile, had his first orders about taking over the colony um, issued in French. This is a copy of what he issued because these were all French French speakers. Um, what happened in Mobile is that most people decided to stay and become British citizens, take the oath of allegiance. Most of the people in the first population center in Pensacola were Spanish and Spain offered to transport anybody who wanted to go to another colony in Mexico. And so almost everybody picked up and left. So they had one place that was struggling they needed to build up. The other, almost nobody was left and they all, almost had to start from scratch. So it's sort of a rocky beginning. The first governor gets on the scene, George Johnstone finally arrives in 1764. 
I'm not going to go through the blow by blow of every detail of all the governors, but I want to introduce a few people to you so you'll understand the political dynamics. John Stone stepped onto the scene and he had a definite vision. He lobbied hard. He wanted the job. He really thought he had a good plan for how, make, how to make the colony prosper. In hindsight, most of what he proposed was probably about as good as you could have done. And most of the governors who followed him actually followed and tried to do some of the things that he recommended. His downfall was that he couldn't get along with anybody. I mean, I mean, everybody he came in contact with, and I'm not exaggerating, ultimately had a falling out with him. Even he was even locked out of his own quarters at the fort in Pensacola one time and forced to climb over the wall to go to bed. And an observer wrote an account and said, at that point, I think everybody could tell about the opinion of this guy. Um, so he, he had these ideas, but he could not convince other people to work with him. The British government in London ultimately got sick of it and said, you're doing exactly the opposite of what we need to have done here, which is to rally this small group of people together to do something. So they dismissed him. And there, there's, a, there's a, a picture of Pensacola, a sketch of it about the time that he arrived. So it's a small town just being laid out and basically the governor lived within the fort. It's a military post. And it, Pensacola remained the colonial capital throughout West Florida's years and remained the primary port. It's a good deep water port. It was a commercial hub, but it was, it was never a thriving commercial hub in the way they wanted it to be. Um, so after John Stone leaves, they appoint another governor, John Elliott, who gets on the scene. He's there a few months. He's starting to rally everybody together. Everybody likes him. After dinner one night, he hangs himself. He, he's, he's gone. So they, they put in a, another temporary governor, Montford Brown, who had been on the outs with Johnston. Montford Brown was not very familiar with what was happening in government. He's almost... He was as surprised as anyone to get the post. And um, so he serves. And while he's serving, he gets into fights. He's investigated for embezzlement of funds. He gets involved in, in a duel with somebody. I mean, so to say this is a tumultuous political beginning is, is a bit of an understatement. It was very unsettled in his first years. They send Elias Durnford um, because Durnford had gone to London as an official to answer to what was happening in West Florida and this ongoing investigation of the sitting governor. And the, the, the authorities got so flustered with the situation, they sent him back with an order that said, when you arrive, you are acting governor until we find somebody who's a permanent fix. So Dern, Dernford was a competent person. He wanted to do other things to make himself more money, like be a surveyor, which he was. Um, so he was there for a short time. They finally got a governor who not everybody loved, but got along with enough people, and that was effective enough that, that Peter Chester, when he stepped in in 1770, he would remain the governor for the rest of British West Florida's years under the British flag. So to the degree it ever found political stability, it was under Governor Chester. And that's sort of a real, real rough overview of the political situation of the colony that we're about to talk about. Um, the, the, the one thing to keep in mind, and I stress this uh, in my presentations, and I, I make a point of it in the book, this is not a, that my book is not a history of every, all the relationships between Native Americans and the colonists. It's not an investigation of Native American society, but it's a full acknowledgement that everything that I'm talking about with West Florida and its development took place within the context of an area that had a majority Native American population. So you cannot talk about it, about its development and the British plans for it without understanding that they were the minority in this region. And the Creeks and the Choctaws and the Chickasaws were the major majority population several times over. And so they had to interact with each other to make anything happen. They were part of the plans that the British had for the colony. And uh, there's an illustration of a Creek town here. If you can, you may have seen this, maybe not. I'll try to help you make sense of it. You're basically looking at a downtown area of a Creek town with a common square ground in the middle with a council house and, and all the, the, the square ground and the basically the governmental structures where they met to decide laws where they welcomed guests as B and A is a place in a roundhouse where they would hold meetings in the winter time, sort of an indoor facility. All those little, little rectangles around there are the way some of the houses and their yards would have been arranged. And uh, most of these Creek towns, or a lot of them, I should say, may have had a thousand or 1500 residents at a time when the largest city in West Florida was about 500 people. So, it kind of flips the notion we have in our mind that 
that the, the Indians are out there somewhere in the woods and the Europeans are in cities. The Native Americans were the urban dwellers here. And they had to negotiate with each other. And the British knew there's no way they're ever going to successfully make this colony that has a stable economy without negotiating with these people. And so that's that's probably their primary foreign relations concern throughout its history is how to make that economic exchange work best, keep the peace, um, keep the Native Americans, if not outright allies, at least not hostile to them because they know they're completely outnumbered and surrounded. So the deerskin trade is the sort of the fundamental glue between these two groups for a long time. Deerskins were in huge demand at the time. They were being turned into everything from, from um, pants to gloves to book bindings in Europe. And they, they were being harvested by the hundreds of thousands by the Native Americans and, and the British traders are dealing this as a major export during their time period. And that is the fabric that ties these two together is economic um, exchange. British had a hard time though, regulating that trade because most of these traders are working independently far away from the observing eyes of most officials. So it's a constant problem for them to regulate it and make sure that they were not mistreating Indians or doing things that might lead to some sort of conflict. And there was some conflict, but um, fortunately for them, it was always relatively small, isolated raids, isolated payback for somebody felt, had felt they were that they had been done wrong. It was never a massive resistance to push the British out. Had they done that, they probably would have been able to. Um, now the colonists, uh, the British colonists that they're coming into this colony, the British citizens who are trying to establish this colony, they're doing all the things that you would think about that they're probably doing if you know anything at all about Gulf Coast history. They're farming, they're farming lots of corn, they're even um, farming chickpeas, they try rice, they do import, do bring in some slaves, so there are plantations. Nothing at all like what we think about when we say the word plantation in the antebellum south. These are not the same scale, but they did have enslaved labor on some of the largest farms. Um, most people made their living uh, by, by herding cattle and hawks was one of the most common uh, occupations. Um, people tried their best to grow tobacco, which was a profitable crop, but it required a lot of labor. And unfortunately for the colonists, um, it, it, the better quantity and quality was being produced elsewhere in the Chesapeake. The, the climate and the difficulties in, in, in growing it and exporting it were just prohibitive to make this a widespread uh, venture. And this was the days before people had a cotton gin and knew how to make money on that. So people were searching for a cash crop here. They tried indigo, which was a really big profitable market for a lot of people in British colonies. But it required enormous amounts of labor and technical skill to produce, to, to grow the leaf and to do all the multi-step processes that you must do to transform this leaf in a vat, in multiple vats, from, from, a, from a, a soup all the way to this dye, a blue dye that's packaged in cakes and sold. Some people found that they can make a lot of money at this. This was to the degree you had major plantations with staple one culture, one crop agriculture in West Florida, this was it. But not everybody had the time and the resources to devote to it and to wait the year or two years it took to get a return. So it was not something that was grown everywhere, but it did make some people some money. Most people, your average people who, who, who did find success uh, agriculturally, they're finding it in the abundant supply of longleaf pine that's all through the Gulf Coast, um, building material for ships, uh, houses, pitch and tar to caulk up the seams and ships, the long straight uh, trees, trunks for ship masts um, in an age when everything that was shipped internationally was shipped in barrels or wooden crates. This provided the raw, raw lumber. So timber is a big industry that everybody can engage in. And this is a map, a detail of a map of the Mobile Tensaw Delta, just north of City Mobile. All those rectangles are uh, property holding. Um, so we're, we're, you can see farmers are coming, they're establishing plantations and small farms. Uh, and it reminds you a little bit if you've seen maps of property owning on the Mississippi River in the early days, it reminds you something of that. It's not the same scale. The cities weren't big, but there were people that were coming in and attempting to farm in the area. The biggest farmers would have lived in houses that looked a lot like this, which is the Krebs Plantation. It's over in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Um, that's a a Creole style cottage, a, a, a early a French uh, almost type of architecture, but that's the vernacular architecture you would have seen in a lot of these places. 
even the biggest, wealthiest planters. I think there's there was one two-story house I've heard of in West Florida, and they made a big deal of it because there was nothing else like that around. This is the days before your huge Greek revival mansions. Um, the one area that experienced a true population growth from immigration during the time period was over in what, what we now know as the Natchez District. It's that triangular shape, a little section of land along the Mississippi. You can go from roughly Natchez, Mississippi, up to Vicksburg. That was the, the area that had good soil. It was on this fertile, in this fertile area along the, the major uh, immigration and, and, and economic highway in the whole continent of Mississippi. So a lot of people gravitated to that area. And most people who were coming in and wanting to start these farms by the 1770s, that is the hot spot. That's the one place that ever really grew dramatically. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later because that, that plays into the story of what happened here in the Revolutionary War. Uh, but even Governor Montford Brown toured it, said, you know, it's the most pro charming prospect in the world. So word got out that the best land and this colony was over on the Mississippi, and that's where people went. Uh, but it was hard to get anywhere in West Florida at the time. We forget how difficult travel was. It could take you months to arrive there from, from the Northeast, and you would have to go a circuitous route over, over land with, before they had a lot of major roads uh, on boats that would take you a long time. There's one gentleman that I detail a story in the book. He just, everything that could happen wrong with immigration happened wrong to him. It didn't happen to everybody, but the poor guy is just exhibit A for all the things that could happen. Now, along his journey, coming from Connecticut to, to establish a, a farm in, in, on the Mississippi River, he lost friends, he lost his wife, um, he, he uh, lost uh, two children to drown in the Mississippi River. Then when he finally got to the land that he had claimed that he thought was legally his, he discovered somebody else living on it. It was, was not legally his. Um, I mean, so you, everything that, that, that made settlement difficult, this guy kind of gives you a little bit of understanding. So I show his story as an illustration of all the setbacks. It wasn't just pick up and we'll go down to Mississippi in a day or two. This was a major move that could take a long time and a lot could go wrong. Um, so as, as the colony grows, Pensacola and Mobile start to grow a little bit. Um, there, there's a small town called Campbelltown that's established outside of Pensacola, which is a settlement for French Protestants that the governor uh, established. They're welcoming anybody who will come. They're allowing practice of, of, you know, of freedom of religion. They're not forcing people to observe um, um, the Anglican church. They're letting Catholics practice because they just need people. They need people that want to settle. Um, and they, they spend, uh, even around the Mobile area, a lot of people are living in the Mobile area. Mobile itself isn't growing dramatically, but the whole Mobile Bay area is being ringed with sediment. And where I'm sitting now in Daphne, Alabama, was a place called The Village. Uh, no elaborate name, that's the predecessor of, of Daphne. And then just down the road, there was a place near roughly where Fairhope, Alabama is, a little, little uh, was started as a hospital camp, was Crofttown. So settlements are popping up, even on the Mississippi coast and down on Dolphin Island, which they still called Massacre Island at the time from his French days. So all over the colony, it's growing. It's just not dramatically. You're not seeing a New Orleans develop, so to speak, but you're seeing settlement. One area that they really hoped would grow dramatically was over on the Mississippi where the Iberville River meets it just south of Baton Rouge today. They really invested a lot of time and money and resources to develop that area because there was hopes, they had hopes that, it, that you could kind of bypass the city of New Orleans and find an alternative route to tap into the Mississippi without going through New Orleans, which was, remember, was part of the Spanish colony of Louisiana at the time. So they found this crazy way to circumvent the Mississippi. What you would do is you would come down the Mississippi, you go into the Iberville River, and from there you would go into the Emmett River, then to Lake Morapa, then to Lake Pontchartrain, then out to the Gulf of Mexico. If it sounds complicated, it was. Not least because the Iberville River, for about 11 months out of the year, it is, is a shallow, dry ditch. One month out of the year, it's a wet ditch. And so they had to dig a huge canal, and they worked at it for years with a lot of people and a lot of money. They never made it work. It was just a Herculean effort. And that whole concept of developing this new uh, 
bastion of settlement on the on the west really never panned out the way they wanted. And the one thing that did come out of it was a lot of smuggling. They ended up all the people that were living there right on the border of Louisiana smuggled uh, goods just incessantly. That was probably the biggest economic activity in the colony, but was off the books and untaxed, so it did not benefit the colony. Um, so we're not talking about a huge population growth. Non-Indian population, um, 1765 of the whole colony would have been about 2,000 people. Uh, it, by 1775, it had grown to the huge number of 5,500 people. It was not exactly grown by leaps and bounds, although it was growing. And this is a time period which if you if you looked at the populations of the surrounding native groups who would have surrounded this colony, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, uh, the uh, the Creeks, primarily, you would have been looking at, at easily 50,000 people. So they're really outnumbered and um, they are they are not growing in the way that they would like to grow. The the American Revolution is, is sort of the uh, one of the main focuses of the book, because that's what got me interested in the topic. How does it fit in? How does this colony fit in with what we know about the 13 colonies? What military action played out there? And to explain that and, and talk about that, and we'll talk about the, some of the details, but to explain that is to really understand even more in more detail all the things I've just said, because it, it brought out everything that the colony was and it wasn't. So I wanna take you through what happened, take you through the experiences of West Florida as it was happening, and I think more than anything else, I hope you understand what life was like, what the sentiments were like, and, and help you understand its role in the war. So we know the Revolutionary War took place mainly on the East Coast. And West Florida seems far, far removed. Um, but we forget that West Florida was invited, as long as was East Florida, twice to participate in the Continental Congress. And twice they politely declined, not because they really disagreed with what they were doing as much as they just thought it didn't concern them. They, they just, they, they were struggling for survival on the Gulf Coast, really were not even familiar with all the debates that were being handed out. There were no newspapers being published in West Florida. It took a long time for news to get there. And most people's daily lives surrounded just trying to make a living. And there's an inordinate amount of people who are in the direct employee of the government because it's a small population with a lot of military posts and a lot of government officials, there's not a huge civilian population that's restless and, and, and able and willing to participate in some of the things that are happening elsewhere. So they just thought it really wasn't something they wanted to be involved in. The one act of all those acts that you've heard about in the, in the whole list uh, that lead up to the war, coercive acts, the Stamp Act, uh, you know, the, all the various things that lead to revolution in the, in the Eastern colonies. Uh, the one thing that generated any real discussion was the Stamp Act here in West Florida because the Stamp Act actually hit people in the pocketbooks on things that they used every day. And they did get a little bit upset about that. And they did talk about their relationship with the, with the British government in reference to the Stamp Act. It's the only act that really, it's the only point in time where you really have any sort of discussion that we have record of where they're really talking about this stuff. And even the attorney general of the colony said, you know, um, if they're going to make rules, they we need to be a part of this government in a more, more effective way. They need to recognize our rights. It's about as far as they went, though, even though Governor George Johnstone did leave a note, he said, you know, some of these ideas of what they call liberty oh, in, the, in the East Coast colonies are beginning to be discussed here. Um, you just never get this big uprising. It never turns into a true revolution. Most people are just content with saying whatever's going on in Boston is their business because that seemed like a world away. Yeah, and in fact, you get a lot of people that just just there are, are so concerned with their daily life that that it, it, one of the historians who's written about British West Florida just tried to describe it just sort of the way I just did. Said this seemed like a long way away, and if you're on on a, a isolated small colony surrounded by large Native American groups that you have uneasy uh, um, relations with, you might enjoy the, the relative protection of the British government as opposed to charging out and joining a revolution that seems like it's a world away. It's not exactly easy to maintain contact with the rest of these colonies. So it's sort of an understandable um, uh, uh, disaffection, if you will, with what's happening. 
Um, and when British government actually did call on the colonists for supplies, they found that they were willing to do it if they could get it for the right price. So it was sort of a conditional loyalty that, that West Floridians had. It was never, they were never this loyalist colony that were just waving the British flag and wanted to remain loyal to Britain. They just wanted peace and they wanted what was best at the time. And most people thought what was best at the time was to stay out of this. So it gets labeled a loyal colony, but needs a little bit more explanation. It wasn't a overtly loyal colony. But during the Revolutionary War, the British government was so happy that there was a colony that was not in open rebellion that uh, they declared West Florida to be a secure asylum for persecuted loyalists elsewhere. You, you could come to the government and say, I'm being persecuted for my desire to remain loyal to Great Britain. They would grant you land in West Florida. And that sparks one of the biggest immigrations to West Florida that occurred during its, its years. And that you could get a lot of land, 100 acres for every man who claimed it, 50 acres for a wife and child. And if they had slaves, you got 50 acres for every slave. So this is an incentive for some large landholders to come to West Florida. And it spurs that immigration. And a lot of people do come. And a lot of them settle over on the Mississippi Valley near Natchez. So that that's that's the biggest um, immigration story of West Florida's years. Now, to the military aspects of the war and how West Florida relates to it, there was one military campaign between the Americans and the British that actually occurred in West Florida. We've forgotten all about it. But while the Continental Congress was meeting up in Pennsylvania. There's some, some, some congressmen that are thinking, how can we involve West Florida in this conflict? We should take those ports. We shouldn't let the British have it. Um, ultimately, they decided it wasn't worth the resources, but there was a gentleman who had lived in the colony that said, I have a way that we could go down there. I can secure the, 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 the neutrality of this colony, and I could get supplies from the Spanish who were very much um, pro-American, who were delivering supplies via the Mississippi River. His name was James Willie. So they authorized him with his small band of troops. He ultimately raised about 100 guys to go down and basically secure neutrality of West Florida, allegedly, and to obtain these supplies. So he goes down the river. And Oliver Pollock, by the way, is you may have heard of him being in Louisiana, but he was one of the major financier of the, financiers of the revolution. He lived in New Orleans, Spanish territory. But with their aid and, and complicit, he actually was aiding the American cause. So they said, we want to we want to make stronger connections with him. So William goes down the river and this what what is supposed to be this this effort to secure neutrality ends up being nothing but a pure, unadulterated raid. A lot of it on people that he didn't get along with when he lived in Natchez. And so he just he's a raid. He, he plunders the area. And um, uh, there, William Dunbar said, all was fish that came into their net. They robbed us of everything. This, this breaks down in sort of a mob that's stealing things to sell at New Orleans. And the, 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 what the significance of all of this is, is not so much that William, what he did, although there's some interesting details there, but the fact that a small group of less than 100 guys with one boat could wreak total havoc on the western bar border of the British colony was an embarrassment, and it showed them they were not prepared if there was a military action in this war, which was ongoing with the United States, and it stepped up, it sparked efforts to step up the defenses. Um, so much so that as Spain was contemplating joining the war, France had already joined the war as an ally, Spain saw what was happening across the river, the British saw what Spain was doing, knew they were funneling supplies to the Americans, Spain and and uh, the colony of Louisiana and the colony of West Florida start eyeing each other as a potential rival and both governments start acting, start thinking, what can we do proactively to secure our colony in case the other attacks us? So remember, this is Louisiana right across the river and its capital is in New Orleans and it has a daring, young, capable governor named Bernardo de Galvez who is not gonna waste a moment getting a chance to attack British interest while they're distracted fighting the Americans in the hopes that they could retake some of that land that they lost after the Seven Years War. So while all these tensions are rising, he's building an army and ready to strike the moment Spain declares war on Great Britain, Great Britain during the American Revolution. And that's exactly what he does. He has independence of the United States declared um, in, in New Orleans. He immediately launches his first attack in 1779, which is a surprise attack. It's lightning fast, 
and he moved from New Orleans up the river, attacked this small fortification at Fort Butte, captured it, moved up to Baton Rouge where there's a much more substantial fortification after some subterfuge where he confused the British as to what direction his attack was gonna come. He attacked it, he secured it, captured the entire post and in the surrender agreement forced the commander to not only surrender the fort at Baton Rouge, but to surrender Fort Panmure up at Natchez, which is 100, 200 miles away. You can imagine the shock of the British uh, commander at Fort Panmure, Panmure when he was told that his, force, his fort had been surrendered and he hadn't, there was no Spanish soldiers anywhere around. But in that, that lightning quick raid, um, Galvez had secured the entire border of West Florida before the British in Pensacola even really knew that they were under attack. There's another story that was happening through a privateer that was operating Lake Pontchartrain you may be familiar with. It's just an interesting footnote. This guy goes out, captures a British ship. He goes on the shore on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain and proclaims it under the control of the United States of America. It's a small action. It's, it's sort of a side note to my main story, but just to show there was other, uh, uh, there were other things happening in this area, but our focus is really on the West Florida and Louisiana story. Um, so anyway, uh, in a matter of just a few weeks before the Spanish, the excuse me, the British in Pensacola even knew they were truly under attack, they had already lost several garrisons and several hundred men. Galvez, before he, the British is going to have uh, going to have a chance to regroup and and defend the colony. Galvez is prepared for another lightning quick strike. He raises another army. January 1780, he heads to try to capture Mobile. He he arrives in front of Mobile. Um, he comes up Mobile Bay, uh, establishes a post there at Mobile Point, which is later where Fort Morgan was established, dam the torpedoes, all that same spot. That's the first outpost they build. They move up Mobile Bay. They lay siege to Fort Charlotte there at Mobile. And ultimately, um, uh, they start, start um, firing on the place with large cannon. The British uh, fort tries to resist, uh, but they're severely outnumbered. They're really trying to buy time while they wait for reinforcements from Pensacola to come, but the reinforcements get there, get from Pensacola outside of Mobile just in time to see the last shots fired and see the fort surrender. So they surrender on March 14th. It's not a big battle. It's 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 you know it's a major city captured. But these are not huge numbers. Uh, so at that point, more than half of West Florida had been taken militarily before the British even were prepared to make a defense. Galvez knows there's one more piece in the puzzle. And if he's gonna capture all of West Florida, he must capture Pensacola, which is the, the capital. And it's where the largest fortifications are and the biggest group of troops. And it's gonna be much different than trying to take anything on the Mississippi or in Mobile. So he goes back, tries to regroup, gets more supplies from the government in Cuba, raises more troops in New Orleans, leaves a small outpost here on Mobile Bay, on the Eastern shore of Mobile Bay, to sort of establish control of the area um, and serve as an outpost in case the British try to do anything. Well, they did try to do something. They, they tried to reverse the momentum of the war by attacking that small outpost of what became known uh, as the Battle of the Village. And some of their reports they actually call it the Battle of Mobile. Uh, but it's a small outpost, 175 men. In the early morning, foggy morning, January, uh, 1781, the British attack this place, thinking that they can capture it, they can move on and retake Mobile, maybe change the whole war. Uh, but much to their surprise, they ran against some pretty stout resistance. It was a long battle. By the end of the day, um, it's the largest Revolutionary War battle fought in the state of Alabama. And you see the casualty numbers there, over, over 30 people killed and a similar number wounded. It's a pretty significant action. Still, it's not Gettysburg numbers, but it's a pretty big battle. End of the day, the Spanish held the position. The British knew that the Spanish were going to attack Pensacola. They had no option but to retreat back to Pensacola and prepare for the inevitable, which was another campaign by Galvez. Um, and indeed, Galvez comes. He brings the largest army he assembled during the entire war uh, to, to bear at Pensacola. It's over 4,000 troops. It's a fleet of warships. And by the end of it, he had secured the the um, assistance of a French fleet. A and at the end of the whole contest, you've got over 7,000 men besieging this, which is still the largest battle fought in the state of Florida. 
And it's the longest siege of the Revolutionary War. It goes on from March until May in 1781. And Galvez secures himself a, some enduring fame um, right at the beginning of the siege because he, he's assembling his fleet outside of the bay. And um, he wants to go into the bay, bay begin the siege. And uh, most of his fleet commanders are unwilling because they point out they don't know the exact route in there. They don't know exactly where the British guns are. They don't want to get grounded and get shot up. They say, let's wait, let's sound this thing out, figure out where to go. Galvez says, we got no time for that. He said, if you won't do it, I'll take my command ship alone and go into the bay. And he does, as everybody watches, the British and Spanish, he boldly goes into the bay. They're firing everything they've got at him. Shells are ripping through the rigging. But he successfully gets into the bay, anchors in Pensacola Bay, sort of shames the rest of his fleet to come in behind him. And for that, he's recognized with a new uh, section on his coat of arms from the Spanish king. Um, that's him on the, on the right, lower right there. Um, you can see a gentleman on a boat and above it, a little banner. And that banner says, Yo Solo, I alone. He's recognized forever for that, that I alone moment of sailing into Mobile, into Pensacola Bay. But once he gets into the bay, they lay siege. It's, they get progressively closer to the, to the British lines in a protracted siege uh, at multiple posts. This isn't just one fortification. It's a series of them. Progressively closer, and that's a map of Pensacola today, so you can see approximate locations of where these historic sites were. Um, the end result is that uh, at the in, in May uh, 18, 1781, they, the final shots are fired almost by accident. They're at Point Blank range, and they're beginning their daily routine of firing while they have at the British, and the British are going to try to return fire. One lucky shot is launched from a mortar. And it makes a perfect beeline towards the temporarily open door where they have the powder supply in Fort George. A very small opening, just big enough to get some powder bags out. They just opened it up and this shot came right in. It blew the whole thing to smithereens and killed hundreds of people right there. And just that ended the siege. So there was a few moments of confusion, but they quickly realized this fight is over and they wave the white flag, and Galvez is commemorated there in downtown Pensacola today with a pretty impressive equestrian statue around which list all these, these battles that I just told you on this military campaign to capture West Florida. So that ended the campaign, and that was 1781. We know the American Revolution ended in 1783, but he had effectively captured West Florida, and in the treaty in 1783, they recognized that by the United States formally declaring that West Florida was now Spanish West Florida. And what would happen in the years to come is that 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 border, remember I told you when it was first established, the Spanish, I mean, the British moved the boundary up. Well, the Spanish wanted to do the same thing. The United States did not agree with that. They said the, the border as originally described in 1763, we want to hold to. It became an international sticking point. It took a long time to debate, to, to hash out. When that little contested area was finally decided to be United States territory and Spain left and agreed to not try to go to war over it, it was immediately annexed into the United States and it became the Mississippi Territory. That's where the origins of the state of Mississippi and Alabama begin. So that's a quick overview of the whole history of this colony of West Florida. Um, the book is out. I should get my copies in a day or so. Um, if you do have an interest in getting a signed copy from me, I'd be glad to, to email me. I'll be glad to help you with that. If not, it's on Amazon and at New South Books, et cetera, um, and it should be in a lot of places. Thank you very much for having me. I'll be glad to answer any questions I can. Wow, Mike, what an incredible story. Um, it just, just kind of makes you wonder, what, what makes you interested in this? <laughs> um, I, I'm particularly interested in stories that are are sort of new. I, I, I'm a historian, and anything that is history that I didn't know seems to intrigue me. This was a story I didn't know, and I quickly found out as I started to read about it, most people didn't know either. And so you don't find a whole lot of that in Deep South history. And so I, I said, I wanted to know more. And, and you right. it didn't take you long to learn that there were not a lot of books about it. It was a, there was a lot of misconceptions about it. If you open up any American history textbook, I've got a few at the house because I'm a, I'm a history nerd and I've taught some classes. 
And I just breezed through and I quickly saw that no maps even show that there was a West Florida at the time of the revolution. They, they just showed everything east of the west of the colonies that rebelled is just Spanish territory. They didn't even have who owned the territory, right? I said, uh, there's got to be a story here. And I began investigating it and we just became really intrigued with it. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and I thought all these, the, the revolutionary era in the Gulf Coast, we feel a lot of times that that's, that's an American story that happened somewhere else. It really didn't, it happened right here as well. And, mm -hmm. and so that's what I wanted to bring out in the book. How do you prepare to research this kind of thing? You just constantly research. I, I, I just, I, I just, I'm, the way I do it, when I, when I investigate any topic that I'm gonna write about, I literally try to get my hands on every available resource. I may not read every page or everything, but I wanna look at everything available. And that's what I did. I looked at everything in print that I could find. Um, and for a topic like this, that's possible. And I, I went to every archives that, that had material that I could get access to. And again, it, you can't say that you can honestly do that with some topics when there's millions and millions of books, but with this, there's a few hundred. And so I was able to do it. And I just made an intensive deep dive into it. And I wanted to produce something that was an introduction to the topic for, because I know most people weren't familiar with it. So I didn't want to produce some detailed narrative about some obscure point that most people had never heard of. I wanted to do a genuine overview introduction to a story of a colony that no one had ever really written much about. Why do you think we don't have this in our history books? Um, because when I think 1812, the first thing uh, that I go back to eighth grade is when they taught us that Louisiana became a state in 1812. <laughs> Well, this, this is prior to 1812. This is Revolutionary War. I've got on my in my book in um, uh, Battle for the Southern Frontier, we talk about Creek War, and that's that the Creek War, the War of 1812, is is where you're talking about Louisiana becoming the state. We talk wow. about that, uh, but this this is even this is American Revolution. I think the reason we don't have it is because we are so fixated and rightly so with with America's actual founding, which was you know in places like Philadelphia. Uh, and surrender at Yorktown. But we forget that while what happened here may have not been directly um, uh, American yet, it was definitely a factor in that whole era and a, definitely a player in this larger revolutionary war, which we often forget was a lot bigger, wide, more widespread international conflict than just American militia against British soldiers. France and Spain and other countries were taking sides in this. And so this is a colonial war that figures directly into British Britain's effort to wage the American Revolution, because if they send any resources to this far flung colony of West Florida, they're almost inherently diverting them from fighting somewhere else in the American Revolution. And so a lot of Amer Americans like George Washington was delighted to see a new theater and operations open up and delighted to see Spain enter and actually help in some way, although Spain never formally allied with the United States. They, they were very worried about making that sort of statement because they were a colonial power too. And they, they knew Great Britain had a fight on their hands and they didn't want the same thing. But at the same time, they could not resist an opportunity to hurt a rival that had recently acquired territory from them. Now your, join, your journey in writing this book, tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, as I mentioned, I became intrigued with the topic. I'd always known a little bit about it. I'd done some really introductory level short pieces on colonial history when I worked with other institutions. And I knew just enough to knew that there was an intriguing story there. I just had never had time to, to research it. So once I started researching it, at first I really thought that what I would produce would be one volume on Gulf Coast colonial history covering all eras. Now I know I'm going to have to write three volumes on Gulf Coast colonial history, writing about British, French, and Spanish, because they all have enough material there. And so this is the first one that I've done. I don't know when I'll finish the others, but I hope to one day. Um, but I, I, the more I researched it and found the material, the more I realized there's a real story for a defined focus book on this. And so I began working on it and uh, just, just putting it together. Uh, all the, as all the topics laid out, I realized there was a real story here and that's what led me to it. I think we've got a question and I was trying to find my question here. 
Let's see if we can't get that back up. Uh-oh. Sam, can you see any questions? I saw some pop up. But, and I'm yes, we up. have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one says, how much did you make use of the biography of Galvez that was published by UNC Press a few years ago? Um, yeah, I looked at it. Uh, there's actually been two that have come out recently. The most recent one, um, literally, I got to look at as we were doing final proofs on this. Uh, the other one, uh, and, and several biographies of him that have been published going back to the 1920s. I looked at them and, and I pulled out everything I could um, and learned some things about Galvez that previously really didn't know. Um, so I, I do uh, try to flesh him out as a person and as a leader. But again, it's the same story with, um, with the Native American story is that I discuss him and his role in capturing uh, British West Florida, but my focus here is is the colony of British West Florida. And maybe if I can get around to writing a history of Spanish West Florida, I might do a little bit more uh, detail on on uh, General Galvez or Governor Galvez, I should say. But yeah, I did I did consult. Awesome. Uh, we have another question, which is an interesting question. It says, in the beginning, when the Spanish left Pensacola, why did they go to Mexico and not New Orleans? Uh, that's where the uh, there was a prosperous colony there, and they sent ships from Veracruz. I don't know all the details of how they decided there. They they some may have been given the option if they wanted to move to New Orleans, but um, the, I know they were specifically invited to come down to the Mexican coast. And we're not talking about a huge number of people. We're talking about about two hundred people. It wasn't like there's this thousands of people in this huge diaspora, but it was basically the people living around that fort. Probably a lot of them were associated. Um, uh, about as families and so I don't know all the details of how that happened and um, I'm sure some would have had the option to go elsewhere but I know that that the ships that were sent came from the Mexican port and carried a lot of them back. Um, our last comment is more of a comment not really a question it says this is an interesting tale I would love to know a bit more of the tutorial clothing, fashion, history related to this, as you mentioned, the vast differences in climates for the settlers, the deer skin trade, the indigo farming, smuggling, etc. And all, all those to some degree are touched on in the book. Um, I know I have a huge section on clothing, but I do have some interesting quotes from people who saw what people were wearing and were shocked at how, how lightly and casually they dressed. Um, and they, they said it's just because of the climate. They said you can't wear all these things we wear in the Northeast, it's just so hot and humid, um, but they just remarked of how casual everybody looked. And, um, and I talk a little bit about, you know, daily life and what life was like. Um, there are some limitations and I've got to be just candid about those is that we don't have a whole lot of really great detailed descriptions of daily life. We have these accounts from people who come through and their interest is on other things. William Bartram is one of the best commentators on on the Southeast at this time, he couldn't care less about what people are living and eating. He just wants to see the flowers and the trees. So you find these little bitty things that are mentioned almost by accident and they're, they're very meaningful, but you don't have many people traveling to evaluate the life ways of these people. And I make the point, one, one, there's a quote in the book by General Haldeman and he's talking about comparing um, life in West Florida with where he was, where he'd been stationed in the Northeast. And, and the, the point is that so many people found so little that was intriguing and different to comment on that you can't help but get the impression that life in British West Florida was probably not generally all that dramatically different than it was in other British colonies because the people who came in did not make a big point of talking about, wow, how different this was. Um, they, they just talked about their economic difficulties. So, I don't know that that's really a valid thing I can prove, but I know that it's not a big point. It's not like they went to a new world and were commenting on it. So it leads me to think that that society there or here um, probably at the time was, was somewhat familiar to people coming from other British colonies at the time. Wow. Well, it is 6.59 and I think we're gonna wrap it up. Mike, we, are, we appreciate you so much and we thank you for 
that enlightenment of uh, history in this part of the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yes. And um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to be presenting these author talks um, the first Thursday of each month. So be sure to join us. Um, stay tuned to our uh, Facebook page or either go to our, our website at www.tree-live.org to try to keep up with the uh, uh, author chats. And we appreciate each of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Good night.